So I'll invite uh, all of us to open our Bible, continuing our exposition of the book of First Samuel. Let us now come to the chap- uh, book of First Samuel chapter 30. First Samuel chapter 30. And we are going to take turn in reading the 25 verses of the first 25 verses of First Samuel chapter 30. I will read uh, verse one, and then I invite every one of you, uh, whether here or at home, to read together first two, and we take turn until until verse 25. So 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 1, I will start. Now when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, the Amalekites had made a raid against the Negev and against Ziklag. They had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire. And when David and his men came to the city, they found it burned with fire, and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. David's two wives also had been taken captive, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, Bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought the ephod to David. So David set out and 600 men who were with him, and they came to the brook Besor, where those who were left behind stayed. They found an Egyptian in the open country and brought him to David, and they gave him bread, and he, he ate. They gave him water to drink. And David said to him, To whom do you belong, and where are you from? He said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant of an Amalekite, and my master left me behind because I fell sick three days ago. And David said to him, Will you take me down to this band? And he said, Swear to me by God that you will not kill me or deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will take you down to this bend. And David struck them down from twilight until the evening of the next day, and not a man of them escaped except four hundred young men who mounted camel and fled. Nothing was missing, whether small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that had been taken. David brought back all. Then David came to the 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow David and who had been left at the brook Besor. And when they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him, and when David came near to the people, he greeted them.
But David said, You shall not do so, my brothers, with what the Lord has given us. He has preserved us and given into our hand the band that came against us. And he made it a statue and a rule for Israel from that day forward to this day. Till so far the word of God. Let us one more time uh, pray and ask for God's blessing. Heavenly Father, we come to you again this afternoon and ask for your mercy and grace as we want to meditate upon your word. May you bless each one of us in whatever situation that we are facing. May you strengthen us with your word. May you uh, speak uh, in deeply into our hearts and uh, shape our mind and our hearts so that all our lives will be pleasing in your sight. Bless your servant who is very limited in many ways that you can use him and, and bless him and, and uh, give him power to speak faithfully your word because it is your word that we need. It is not human idea, human, uh, uh, human uh, imagination, but it is your word that will become the light unto, uh, for our path and the, the, the light into our way. May you bless each one of us as we receive your word and be encouraged, be molded according to your will for your glory alone. Thank you, Lord. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we give thanks and pray. Amen. Right, brothers and sisters, uh, we uh, continue our uh, exposition of the book of Samuel. We have First Samuel, and I will start by uh, quoting what the uh, what the prophet Amos in the Bible uh, once he used a graphic sermon illustration, which pictures a man fleeing from a lion, only to meet a bear, and he runs from the bear, and finally reaches his house, but, he is, uh, uh, but as, as he is panting and feeling relief, resting against the wall, suddenly a snake bite him. He thought he was reached safety finally, only to discover he had failed to see his enemy slithering along the top of the wall. Brothers and sisters, it must have been, uh, seems like that to David and his men in the chapter 13 of this uh, first Samuel. They had just escaped from the trap. If you remember, a few days, a few weeks ago, we uh, listened to that, how they escaped from the trap of having to fight with the Philistines against their own people, Israel. How relieved they must have been to start out for Ziklag that morning, leaving Afek uh, for 100-kilometer journey to Ziklag. It is even bearable when such a burden has been lifted. But when they arrive at home, the snake bites. No town, no families. Everything is burned down. Everyone is taken away. There is one of the darkest day in the, uh, this is one of the darkest day in their lives. But it provides us with many important lessons that we can learn, um, at least there are three of them that we are going to meditate this afternoon. The first one we can see from verse 1 to 6a, we will see that when temptation overwhelms us. Again, we are given the reader's age in the, in the first few verses. We know what happened before David and his men discovered it. Amalekite raid, Ziklag hit and torch. All the women and the children taken captive by these uh, Amalekites. When David and his men finally arrive at Ziklag, you uh, can uh, remember, uh, you can imagine how they were uh, they were uh, they were walking towards this Ziklag, their own city. They can see the the city was burning, and soon they discover what we already know: the shock of the smoldering rubble the sorrow of wives and children taken. There was but one thing to do, wail. 
first forces, they wept until they had no more strength to weep. The sadness soon turned into bitterness toward David. One commentator said probably some of David's men did not agree with the whole idea of seeking refuge in the Philistines in the first place. So now this has happened. Now they were bitter toward David and they wanted to stone him. The disaster at Ziklag seems even more unbearable if we understand its immediate context. After receiving a marvelous deliverance from the great dilemma, dilemma that we have discussed two weeks ago, we can imagine how long David and his men wanted to enjoy the relief among loved ones at home in their city. How long those 100 kilometers uh, from Afek to Ziklag seems and how they look forward to arriving at Ziklag. But then this happened. A marvelous escape, a moment of a moment to breathe, a grand relief, only to be thrown into the pit again. We who live in Melbourne and Auckland now, our brothers and sisters there, can also understand this, this kind of feeling with the second uh, the second second lockdown that we are experiencing now. It certainly feels much better than the first, uh, it, it certainly feels much harder than the first lockdown. On, not only because the measure taken is harsher, although it's necessary, I believe, but also because we have just experienced a bit of relief before it happened again. After, I still remember after the, the Thanksgiving that we had uh, uh, on the 5th of July, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, which allowed for 20 people attended here on, on, on site. We actually expected, I definitely expected, we could gather for up to 50 people uh, in the church the following weeks. And, and, and I can imagine 100 people in the next few weeks. Instead, we can only have five people who do the ministry in these last few weeks. And I know many other difficult personal experiences that you are facing one few of you have called me and sharing your, your burden and your, your, your struggle. And here is a sobering and disturbing picture for God's people. Are there not times when you think it cannot get any worse? First Samuel 30 says, yes, it can. There are times when you conclude that your present trouble is the last throw. You simply cannot take any more. Then comes Ziklag, the last throw after the last throw. Our text teaches us that our distress and troubles could intensify in our lives. However, this is the, the, the realism and the brutal honesty of the Bible. No hiding truth, nor preaching of half-truths. Here is no false advertising of prosperity gospel. As God's people, you may be overwhelmed with troubles. You may receive more than you think you can even handle. This is especially the experience of few of us, I know. But this truth does not leave us comfortless. Because it is God himself who tells us the reality that we are facing, that we will face in our lives. We can trust a God like that. We can depend on the Holy Scripture that tells us you, this hard reality in our life. Yes, it is true when Jesus said, in the world you have trib tribulation. He did not reduce it to small print or hide it in a footnote. But thank God, this God who says you will have tribulation, this God who says uh, uh, through Apostle Paul, if you, everyone who wants to live a godly life will be persecuted. But this Jesus who says in the world you will have tribulation, he also did not stop there. He tells you the hard truth 
He tells you the honest truth, but he also continues. But take heart. I have overcome the world. These words of Jesus leads us to our second point, which is uh, the experience of David when he strengthened himself in the Lord. Verse 6b to 9, we'll see here. David was greatly distressed, obviously, here. Not only because his wives were taken and his uh, children were taken by the enemies, but also because the people spoke of stoning him. Verse 6b says, For all the people were bitter in soul, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. This is the hope that this is we can learn how we can also strengthen ourselves in the Lord. What does it mean? What does strengthen oneself in the Lord mean? Firstly, we need to, to, to understand, to know what it is not. It is not a gospel magic, first of all. To strengthen ourselves in the Lord is not a gospel magic, not a quick fix. It is not recognizing that the pressure is on on our life and so deciding to seek, to seek help in religion. The Lord is not a genie you rub in a trouble in order to make you feel better. Jesus is not your own personal pain reliever to get you on top of life's pains. Strengthening yourself in the Lord is nothing so superficial or superstitious as that. It is also not the catharsis. It's not like catharsis. Catharsis is the process of releasing and providing relief from strong or repressed emotion. Although I believe there is a place for that in our lives. Like verse 4 also says that when David and his men wailed to the point of exhaustion, sometimes it is, uh, we can find relief to talk to someone, to our friend, to a counselor, to, a, to, to the pastor, to, to express our repressed emotion. It is, it is, it is, there's a place for that. But there's a difference, there's a big difference between pouring out your sorrow and strengthening yourself in the Lord. Saul was in great distress in chapter 28, if you look at that, and he expressed it there and grieved about it. And yet, he did not strengthen himself in the Lord. In other words, someone can let all the emotions out without strengthening himself in the Lord. So how, how then uh, do we strengthen ourselves in the Lord? Where does we begin? I think we should begin precisely where David did. He started with a personal God. Verse 6b says, Then David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. J. Pecker wrote in his famous book, Knowing God, there's a big difference between knowing God and knowing about God. You can know a great deal about God without knowing God personally in your life. One time I heard personally a, a, a missionary gave a testimony about his conversion and his uh, eventually his calling. He was born from a Christian family and practically had been a Sunday school since birth. He knew inside out John 3, 16, so or so he thought. Until one day he heard a preacher preach this and only then he realized that not only that God loves the world and gave himself, uh, gave his only son to the world, but the son also loved me and gave himself up for me. He only understand that at that time. An Old Testament theologian, Alexander McLaren, says here, David could no longer say, my house, it's all, go it's all gone. Or my city, it's all gone. Or my possession, there's nothing left. Even my family, my, the family, wife, my children, my wives, all 
been taken. But he still could say here, my God. He strengthened himself in the Lord his God. This is where the strengthening must begin. To know the God who not only loves the world, but also loves you and cares for you personally. As Apostle Paul says in Galatians 2.20, when he says that uh, my life, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me, and my life I live in the flesh, is in the Son of God who loves me and gives himself for me. We should start there to know this God who loves us and gave himself up for us, for me. But how, how exactly do you strengthen yourself in the Lord? Does our text provide some clues about this? Although not explic- ex- uh, explicitly, the text certainly gives us clue that you strengthen yourself in the Lord by remembering the promises and affirmation of his word. There's a very similar language used in the uh, chapter 23, 23 of this book, verse 16b, when it says, Jonathan strengthened David's hand in God. Even uh, in, in, in Indonesian language, it's, it's, very, uh, it's the same translation as here. But this, this is only a little bit different. Jonathan strengthened David's hand in God. And how did he do that? How did uh, Jonathan strengthen David in, in God? First, the next verse says, Jonathan said to David, verse 17, Do not fear, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel. You remember when I exposed this, uh, is the Jonathan here only actually reaffirmed and emphasized the promise of the kingdom that Yahweh had already made to David himself. This is what strengthens. David strengthened himself in the Lord by remembering Yahweh's promise and how he knows Yahweh will not allow even one of his words to fall to the ground. And in all history, if you read the Bible, if you read the history of God's people, God's people strengthen themselves in precisely this way. Andrew Bonner, a free church Scotland pastor, wrote in his diary in October 15, 1864, of his grievous wound because Isabella, his wife of 17 years, died apparently of complication following childbirth. He wrote that on that day of her death, he had, according to his custom, been meditating on a scripture text between dinner and tea. On that day, it had been Nahum 1, verse 7, which says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. Again, I write, I read it for you. The Lord is good, Nahum 1.7. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. Andrew Bonner adds, Little did I think how I would need it half an hour after. He mentioned it, in his diary along with his wife's death because he was strengthening himself in the Lord his God. It was the promise of God's word, the affirmation of God's character that was keeping keeping him on his feet during this difficult time. I hope this is also what keeping you on your feet during the difficult time you are facing right now. The second way we can strengthen ourselves in the Lord is by using our access to his presence. Note here the connection between 6b to uh, 7 and uh, verse 7 and 8. Yeah, you can see here verse 6b it says that 
that David, uh, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. But then the next verses says, and David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the effort. So Abiathar brought the effort to David, and David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue after this man? Shall I overtake them? He answered him, pursue, for you shall surely overtake and shall surely rescue. This is the second way how we can strengthen ourselves in the Lord is by using the access that he has given to us. As David did. But someone will say, how, how about now? How about now? Uh, now we lo- no longer have a priest and effort, do we? No, we, we don't have a priest like uh, the Old Testament priest. But we have someone who is even greater than the Old Testament priest. Hebrew 4 verse 14, 16 says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one in, who is in every aspect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We may not get precise answers to our questions, but we will find grace to help in our time of need, which is we, which is, we usually need that more than answers, specific answers in, in, the tr- in the trouble that we are facing. What we actually need is not information, but endurance to stay on our feet, So I encourage anyone of you who are really struggling during this time to come to God, to cry to Him, to come with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hold fast to this word of God, to His promise that we will find grace to help in time of our need. Thirdly and finally, brothers and sisters, we will see here also that when we find grace in time of need, we will see that this grace of God is so decisive in our lives. As in David. After strengthening himself in the Lord and receiving God's direction through priest Abiatar. David led his 600 men pursuing the Amalekites. But when they came to the brook Besor, 200 men stayed behind because they were too exhausted to cross the brook Besor. And with 400 men, David defeated Amalekites and recovered all that they had taken, including their wives, children, and plus all the flocks and herds. Also, he had taken everything that the Amalekites had taken from other places because uh, they had taken, apart from Ziklag, Amalekites also had raided many other cities. And all this, all the raids, all the plunder, all, all the spoils have been taken by David and his men. So his, they have taken not only what they had before, but plus plus. Then David and the 400 men returned to the 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow David. Then some of the 400 men said, because they did not go with us, verse 22, because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except that each man may lead away his wife and children and depart. When I read this sentence, it is, quite shocking to me that I found myself at first agreeing with this statement. It is shocking because the Holy Bible stated that these men are wicked and worthless fellow. 
But I know that many Christians are also facing the same problem. Many, many, uh, many, many Christians are uh, probably also are agreeing with me with this. I know this because uh, I, I remember a few years ago um, in, in uh, one of the NREC uh, when I, I preached there in one of the, the, the session there and uh, I, I was uh, explaining about, I was preaching from the book of Matthew about the, the, the parable of, of, uh, of the servants, the workers in the vineyard. And uh, as you know the story, uh, the, the, the Lord of the vineyard, the owner of the vineyard uh, uh, went out in the morning at the morning at 6 a.m. in the morning and looked for the workers to work in, the, in his vineyard. Uh, do you want to work? Okay, okay, work. And then, okay, you start to work and I will give you, and we agree, uh, they agree to have uh, uh, the, the order to pay one, one denary to these workers because that is the one day wage at that time, one denary. One dinner. But then at 9 a.m., the, 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 the owner also went out and the, the, he saw some more people who are still not working. They start just stay in the market waiting uh, for someone to, to hire them. And he said to them, do you want to work uh, also in my vineyard? We still, we still need some more uh, people to work. Uh, okay, they agree. And I will give you whatever is uh, uh, suitable, whatever is, uh, is uh, uh, suitable. Uh, uh, for you. They agree to work and then uh, the sa uh, same thing happened at 12 p.m., same thing happened at 3 p.m., and the same thing happened at 5 p.m. the last time. Only uh, the last people still uh, start to work at 5 p.m. And then when 6, 6 p.m. it's uh, finished, uh, finished working time, and the owner started to uh, give the wage uh, to these uh, people, the workers. And he started to give the wage from those people who started the last, which is only uh, work for one hour, the one who start at 5 p.m. And he gave one denary to them. And the people at the back, the one who started uh, the, the earliest, like 6 a.m. in the morning, who already worked for, for 12 hours, and he, they thought to themselves, oh, this is very generous, uh, generous uh, 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 owner. And he gave one denary for those who work only one hour. We should be able to, to get uh, at least 11 or 12 denary. But uh, when it comes to them, they only receive one denary also. And I asked to the, the people, a few hundreds of them, maybe more than 1,000, and um, honestly, if you know this story, this what happens, uh, I ask them, uh, which one do you, will you choose? Will you choose to, uh, to work at 6 a.m. in the morning or you will uh, choose to 6, 5 p.m. in the morning if you know that you will, both will get one dinari? Honestly, I ask them. And about 90% more who raised their hands said they will choose to work at 5 p.m. Only a few people raise their hands and say they will work at 6 a.m. This is a, a big problem deep in our hearts. In our hearts, also in mind. Big problem for us to understand and to really believe the doctrine of grace, the doctrine of sola gratia. I'm not talking about understanding the doctrine with our mind but really believing and living out this truth in our daily life. Many Christians secretly still believe in the hearts like the wicked and worthless men because they did not go with us. We will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered by our own hands. They essentially said, we have risked our life to defeat the Amalekites while the 200 people still sit behind the brook Besor and they did not nothing. Did, had, they, they did nothing. It's only just if we do not share the plunder that we have recovered with the risk of our lives. It seems very logical and makes sense. 
After all, we all know and we, we, we experience in our life that, that there is no such things as free lunch in this world. But Dale Davis correctly said, this is a difference between grace and works. And it is the difference between worship and idolatry. If we follow the mindset of the troublemakers and the worthless men, we will end up in idolatry, worshiping ourselves. This is the spoil that we have recovered with our own hands. We will think that all that I have, all of my success, all of my achievement are due to my hard work, my sacrifice, my own hands. I am what I am because of my perseverance and my hard work and my intelligence and my wisdom. This is idolatry. But David knew better. This is not the spoil that we have recovered, David said. But it is what Yahweh has given us. Look at verse 23. 23. David said, you shall not do so, my brothers. He said in a gentle way. He still called these people my brothers. You shall not do so, my brothers. With what the Lord has given us. He, the Lord, has preserved us. And the Lord has given into our hand the band that came against us. The man who truly believes that all he has is God's grace, God's gifts, find himself repeatedly on his knees, adoring, thanking, and praising God. But if we do not grasp this doctrine of grace, this truth about God's grace, we will plummet into idolatry, for that is the inevitable result of self-sufficiency. So the difference between grace and works is the difference between worship and idolatry. It is so urgent for us, for you and for me, to see that for David, for, for David grace is not merely some theological concept, but as a worldview that sinks deep into his heart and his mind. It's not something that applies only to how we enter the kingdom of God, but to every moment and every aspect of our lives. What Yahweh has given us dominates David's heart and controls his decision and action. So grace must always be the decisive and dominating factor in the Christian practical theology. He or she must constantly confess that this, this success, this employment, these loved ones, this health that we have, this meal that we have every day is what Yahweh has given us. As Paul said to the Corinthians, what do you have that you did not receive? If you understand and truly believe this truth, you'll find it very humbling. But it is the only thing that will keep you from worshipping yourself. Let us remember, let us also this truth about the grace of God really dominate our mind, our hearts, and give effect to whatever we do in our lives. So let us remember, during this time of trouble, we, we know that God has given us this truth for us. And um, it's not only 
telling us the truth, the reality that we are facing, but also He has promised us His strength, He's promised us His word, He's promised us His grace, and this grace, let us pray and let us believe that this grace really dominates our lives, the way and our, our action and the way we think, the way we speak, the way we live our lives. So that grace will be the dominant factor in all our aspect of our lives. So we will give glory to God and we will find strength in the time of need. Let us bow our heads, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this afternoon and ask again for your grace and mercy as we have listened to your word. May your Holy Spirit speak continually in our, in our hearts, in our mind, to drag our mind and hearts, to lead our mind and hearts and our lives and what we do and our, what we speak will be dominated by the truth that all I am, all that we have, all that we have achieved is all only possible because of your grace alone. Help us to be your humble people with humility to serve one another, to glorify your name. Because we know everything good that we have received is only because of your grace. May you lead and guide each one of us, O oh Lord. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we give thanks and pray. Amen.